When we talk about aircraft, we usually envision either small private planes or huge commercial jets, both soaring high above the ground, landing and taking off from vast concrete runways. But what if I told you that the story of aviation didn't just unfold in the sky and on land, but also on water? Yep, that's where hydroplanes come into the picture. Welcome to the Big Metal Birds, where we dive deep into the fascinating world of aviation. Don't forget that your likes fuel the creation of new videos. So hit that like button, make sure you're subscribed to our channel, and let's go. In the early days, as aviation technology was just finding its footing, inventors and pioneers were also toying with the idea of aircraft that could land and take off from water bodies. The aim was clear, to create a versatile machine that could reach places conventional planes could not. Think remote islands, far-flung fishing communities, and in general, areas without proper runways. But getting an aircraft to work harmoniously with water was easier said than done. Water resistance, buoyancy, and balance were just some of the issues they had to contend with. But as they say, where there's a will, there's a way. When we delve into the history of hydroplanes, certain names and innovations stand out for taking this form of aviation from concept to reality. Let's start with the Wright brothers. While they are famous for their pioneering work in aviation, they too dabbled in the idea of a water-based aircraft. The Wright Model G of 1913 was a modest but important step toward aircraft that could maneuver on water. Though the Model G didn't make much of a splash, it showed that the concept was viable. However, the first person to get a seaplane, then termed as a hydro aeroplane, into the air was actually a Frenchman named Henri Fabre. His aircraft, named Le Canard, took its first waterborne flight in 1910. That flight only covered about 1,600 feet, but it proved that a plane could indeed operate on water. An American aviation engineer, Glenn Curtis, was the first to take a seaplane from a small pond to the open sea. In 1911, his Curtis hydroplane took off from San Diego Bay, marking a major milestone in seaplane development. He even snagged some of the earliest patents for hydroplane technology including retractable landing gear for amphibious operations. Curtis didn't just stop at individual aircraft. His work paved the way for naval aviation, with aircraft carriers using Curtis's designs as inspiration for catapult systems. World War I saw the rise of hydroplanes in military use, particularly by the British. The Supermarine Walrus was one of the more famous models. Designed as an air-sea rescue aircraft, it was the first British Squadron Service aircraft to incorporate a fully retractable main undercarriage, completely enclosed crew accommodation, and surprisingly, an onboard toilet. It was functional, and it got the job done during a time of need. In the realm of hydroplanes, you can't ignore the gargantuan Hercules H4, popularly known as the Spruce Goose. Conceived by the iconic American entrepreneur Howard Hughes, this flying boat was intended for use in World War II to transport troops and supplies across the Atlantic, bypassing German submarines. It remains the largest flying boat ever built, with a wingspan of 320 feet, although it only ever made one flight in 1947 for about a mile. And at an altitude of 70 feet, its sheer size and ambition captured the world's imagination. While the Hercules H-4 never became operational, it serves as a testament to what is possible when engineering ambition knows no bounds. After the First World War, hydroplanes found new uses. One of the most iconic hydroplanes of the 20th century is the consolidated PBY Catalina. While used extensively during World War II for anti-submarine warfare, few Catalinas were modified for civil aviation and were used for rescue operations. But bringing a plane from tarmac to sea came with its set of challenges. The primary and most significant challenge for seaplanes to achieve wide adoption is that water landings require calm conditions. Rough seas or choppy lakes can make landing a hydroplane dangerous or even impossible. The aircraft's dependence on favorable weather 
can limit its usability, especially in regions prone to storms or high winds. Water isn't always a machine's best friend. The continual exposure to water, especially salt water, can lead to corrosion and wear, requiring frequent and potentially costly maintenance. It's not just about mechanical reliability, it's also a matter of safety. Given their design constraints and the need for buoyancy, hydroplanes generally offer less cargo space compared to traditional land-based aircraft of similar size. While they excel in flexibility, they are not the go-to choice for heavy cargo transport. But these challenges didn't stop the enthusiasm and dream to take off from water. As a result, dozens of projects were started. With all the different designs and use cases of hydroplanes, one size doesn't fit all. Different missions and environments call for different designs. Here, we'll break down the main categories and give you some iconic examples of each. Let's start with float planes. These are essentially regular airplanes fitted with pontoons or floats instead of wheels. Picture a Cessna 172, a popular light aircraft that many of us are familiar with. Now, replace its wheels with a pair of floats and voila, you've got yourself a float plane. Float planes are especially popular among private pilots for leisurely flights over lakes and coastal areas. But if not talking about the modifications of the conventional planes, the de Havilland Canada DHC-2 Beaver is a name that you'll often hear when talking about hydroplanes. This single-engine bush plane, originally designed for flying in rugged conditions, became a float plane star. It's reliable, versatile, and popular for everything from recreational flights to transporting goods to remote areas. Next, let's talk about flying boats. Unlike float planes, the fuselage of a flying boat serves as its hull, allowing it to float directly on the water. Flying boats are generally larger and can carry more cargo, making them ideal for commercial operations and military use. The Grumman G21 Goose is a classic in the flying boat category, initially designed as a luxury commuter plane for businessmen in the late 1930s it quickly found use in World War II as a transport and search and rescue aircraft. Even today, some restored geese are still in operation, serving remote communities and thrilling aviation enthusiasts. Amphibious aircraft take versatility to a whole new level. They have retractable wheels as well as floats, enabling them to take off and land on both solid ground and water. It's like the Swiss Army knife of aviation, a jack of all trades that offers unparalleled flexibility. This type of aircraft has become increasingly popular in the last few decades as the global economy has grown stronger and more people can afford these expensive toys. The Icon A5 is a modern gem in the world of amphibious aircraft. Its folding wings even allow for easy transport and storage, a feature that reflects how far hydroplane design has come in terms of convenience and innovation. However, since A5 is an expensive toy, it cannot sustain the entire industry on its own. Therefore, there must be a reason why hydroplanes are still in use today. One of the most intriguing aspects of hydroplanes is their versatility. Far from being niche aircraft, they serve a range of purposes that make them indispensable in some unique scenarios. In the commercial sector, hydroplanes provide vital links to remote or island communities where traditional airfields are impractical or non-existent. In the Maldives, for example, a vast archipelago with countless small islands, seaplanes are used for everything from transporting tourists to local inter-island commuting. Alaska and parts of Canada with their myriad of lakes and rugged terrain, similarly rely on hydroplanes for mail delivery, freight services, and passenger flights. Aircraft like the DHC-2 Beaver and the Grumman G-21 Goose have been the workhorses in these regions, known for their reliability and ruggedness. Hydroplanes also play a critical role in emergency and military operations. Their ability to land on water 
makes them uniquely suited for search and rescue operations. Think of scenarios like a boating accident far from shore, where a hydroplane can land nearby to provide immediate assistance. They have also been used in firefighting, capable of landing on lakes to refill water tanks quickly, and then flying directly to the site of a forest fire. During World War II, planes like the Supermarine Walrus and the Consolidated PBY Catalina served as reconnaissance and search and rescue aircraft, proving their worth in life and death situations. Even if the A5 price tag can shock you, there still is a niche market for private pilots who prefer to take off from nearest pond instead of driving to the airfield. Imagine flying out to a secluded lake, landing on the water, and enjoying a day of fishing or swimming before taking off again. The experience blends the thrill of aviation with the allure of water sports. It's not just about the destination. The journey itself becomes an adventure. So there you have it, hydroplanes in all their glory. From their rich history featuring visionaries like Glenn Curtis and the iconic Hercules H4, to their diverse types and practical applications, these waterborne aircraft are as fascinating as they are versatile. Whether it's the freedom and thrill they offer to private pilots, their indispensable role in remote communities, or their valiant service in emergency and military situations. If you found this deep dive into the world of hydroplanes as fascinating as we do, don't forget to hit that like button. And if you want to keep exploring the marvels of aviation with us, make sure to share this video and subscribe to our channel. Your support fuels our journey through the skies and it's big metal birds.